Welcome, everyone. This is The Advocates. I'm Dan Cerucci. Welcome back. We've got a great show, as usual, for you today. You know what we say? Everybody's an advocate for something, whether you know it or not. So today on the program, we do have an advocate. He happens to be an attorney for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and his name is Rob Patron. Rob, how are you? I'm very well, thank it's you. It's great sir. to meet you. It's very and nice to meet you. Now, Rob, you have an interesting story to tell, and you're advocating for something that, well, I think it's a great cause. It has to do with Christopher Columbus. And, well, if you're my age, you know Columbus as the man who discovered the Americas. Okay? In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and so forth and so on. So we were taught as children to revere Columbus, but it's not that way anymore, Rob. What's not going no. on? What's going on is that there are, um, how shall I put it, there are ideological adversaries of Western culture. They, there always has been. And in the age of information with the advent of the internet, this uh, intersection of ideological adversaries have been able to speak more and more with a single voice. And in a form, something approximating a coalition, if you will. One of the things that this sort of coalition of anti-Western culture advocates are doing to bring down what they perceive to be their ideological adversary, the West, is a multi-prong attack, one of the prongs of which is the attacking of American icons. They're doing this in an attempt to turn hearts and minds away from Western culture, cast it in a sinister light, uh, it's sort of a postmodernist perspective that you, deconstructs. You feel it's 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 a concerted, planned, sort of global effort. Well, there is definitely. I think that that globalism plays a large part uh -huh. in this effort. The the idea that uh, we're citizens of the world, not a particular country, and we have to think globally. Yes, which is not necessarily a bad idea. However, it has gone to the extreme to the extent that the agenda of globalism has made attacks against the individual sovereignty of nations. And the traditions of Western civilization. Indeed, because they form the ideology of many Western sovereignties. So one of the prongs of attack here is to attack American icons. So uh, they started with the initial icons in American history, the Founding Fathers. And of course, the first Founding Father in what we now know as Western culture was Christopher Columbus. And, and this is something that Rob has said that I found, find absolutely fascinating. And he, he coined a great way of, of, of saying it, which is identifying Columbus as our first Founding Father. He is. Well, we usually think like of George Washington sure. and, and Benjamin Franklin and sure. Thomas Jefferson, people like that. Yes. But you're going back, what is it, a few hundred years yes. prior to yeah, that? Yeah, about three centuries prior. And why, are, so why are you calling him our first founding father? Well, of course, Washington and Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, they were the founding fathers of the United States. But uh, the United States is a smaller part of the Western world, of, of North and South America, the Americas. And the Americas were discovered, and we use the term discovered in a very specific way, and this is one of the things that's been criticized about using the term, using the phrase, Columbus discovered America. When we say discovered, we mean he brought it to light to the rest of the Western world. At the time, the Americas were populated by Asiatic tribes that had come over to those continental land masses from Asia over the Bering Strait on ice bridges that had been formed during the Ice Age. There was no semblance of Western culture in, the, in those continental land masses. Columbus came over and brought the Spaniards with him and opened up the Americas for migration from Europe. And so Western, that was the advent of Western culture. So he brought with him 
Judeo-Christian values, uh, Greco-Roman democracy and law, uh, those sort of foundations of Western culture. Now, Mike, if I can just interrupt you, Rob. When I was in Norway recently, um, they told us that the Vikings came across the North Atlantic they did. and came to Newfoundland. They did. And that they were the first. And there are, there is even archaeological evidence that they came as uh, much further south into that portion of North America that is now the northern part of the United States. And there's also archaeological evidence of Roman swords and helmets off the east coast of the continental landmass of the United States. So even before the Vikings, the Romans quite possibly were here. However, these people had temporary settlements here. The, the Vikings came for lumber and left shortly thereafter. The Romans, we don't even know if, if they ever got word back to the rest of the world about their discovery. Right. Those who preceded Columbus never brought that information to light to the rest of the Western world, but Columbus did. So he discovered America in the sense that he uncovered this area of the world for the rest of the world. The rest of the known world at that time, yes. and for the leaders of the known world at that time. That's right. OK? And so that was a really incredible breakthrough. It was game changing. It was game changing. To say okay. The least. Now, Columbus had four different voyages here. That was another thing that, that set him apart. He had, yes. Well, he had three voyages. The first voyage, he came f looking for an all water route to Asia. All right. So at the time, Venice and Genoa had a monopoly, a trade monopoly over the Mediterranean, which was the main way Europeans traded with the East. At the same time, uh, much of Europe was occupied by jihadists. And I say jihadists because you know, saying the Moors it, it doesn't really do it justice. The Moors, the Arabs, the Berbers, there were a lot of these folks that had come over into Europe. But a section of them were radicals that wanted to enslave the West and, and impose their radical brand of, uh, of religion onto the, onto the West. And they had succeeded. Since 711 AD, they had occupied a great deal of Europe. And this was plaguing the sovereignty of European nations for a great deal of time. So what Columbus had figured out was that we could actually, because it was commonly accepted by scholars at the time that the world was probably round and not flat, and Columbus bought into that very early, he thought if we, if we sailed west around the world, we could cut out the Mediterranean and avoid the trade monopoly that, the, that his own people, the Genoans, and the Venetians held over the Mediterranean. And Spain found this idea very tempting because they had just unified three Spanish nations, Castile, Aragon, and Leon, had just unified to form the first superpower. Mm -hmm. So they thought now is the time to rid Europe of the jihadist invaders who are killing and enslaving us. So they said they thought that if they could make an alliance with the great Khan, whom they perceived to be the, the, the emperor of China, uh, that this would help fight a two-front war against the jihadists. So this was one of the reasons why they agreed to fund Columbus's expedition to find an all-water route to Asia. What Columbus didn't expect, however, and which no scholar in in, in all of history expected was that there would be two continents between here <laughs> and now. Columbus, of right. course, expected that there was going to be two continents between there between and here Asia. And, and these. Now, yeah. of course, Columbus expected that before he hit mainland China, he would hit some islands that were probably right. occupied by Asian colonists. Right. And that's exactly what happened right. when he hit the when he hit the when he hit the West Indies. Uh, so that was right. the first. That uh, was the first voyage. Yeah, I have to interrupt for a second, folks. I just got to say. Don't you love this guy's passion? I love his passion. And he's really, he's a scholar in this area. You've really studied all of this, Rob. I have. You went back into the original sources. The primary sources, yes. The primary sources to study all this. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what triggered your, your if, if you could tell us quickly, what triggered your interest in going back to those primary sources and doing this? Yes. There is an attorney in Philadelphia who 
has petitioned Philadelphia City Council to eliminate the municipal holiday of Columbus Day on the false narrative that Columbus was a murderer, a rapist, a genocidal maniac, and a horrible person. All of that is untrue, by the way. And so city council turned to the 1492 society. These are the people that put together the Philadelphia Columbus Day Parade. And city council said to the 1492 society, do you have an historian on staff that might be able to help respond to this petition? And they do have an historian on staff, Mike DePilla, but pre-Columbian history is not his specialty. His specialty is the, uh, how the founding fathers based the American Republic on the Roman Republic. But Mike said, I do have a friend who's a professional researcher, and perhaps he can help you. So when city council asked me if I would help them, I said, yes, put me on that project. So city council bought me the primary sources, and... I began the this research. This is an amazing story, everybody. We are going to take a break. I'm Dan Cerucci. This is The Advocates. We will be right back with Rob Petrone and more of this incredible story and why he says that Columbus was actually America's first civil rights champion. We'll be right back. Or use an email marketing. Investing in your brand is so very important, and we can't wait to have you as a guest. Shelter dogs aren't broken. They've simply experienced more life. If they were human, we would call them wise. They would be the ones with tales to tell and stories to write. The ones dealt a bad hand who responded with courage. Do not pity a shelter dog. Adopt one. Say we've got grit, and we'll take it as a compliment. Because it's our uncommon drive, our spark within, that brings us together and sets us apart. We are temple made. And when others take shortcuts, when others take breaks, when others take the easy way, we Take charge. Add us on social media to watch bloopers, behind the scenes footage, previews, and more. Hi there, everybody. Dan Cerucci. Welcome back to The Advocates. We're talking with Rob Patrone. Our quote, our word of the week, we'll have the quote of the week at the end of the program, but our word of the week is splenetic. Splenetic. An interesting word, isn't it? S-P-L-E-N-E-T-I-C. A person who is splenetic is bad-tempered, ill-humored, Ill or spiteful. I don't know, Rob Patrone, I think some of these people who are attempting to denigrate, the tr uh, or destroy the true story of Christopher Columbus may also be motivated by spite. They may be spiteful. Now, you have called Christopher Columbus, and this is quite audacious, America's first civil rights leader. Tell us why really isn't audacious. I, I mean, it's borne out by the primary sources. Look, you can, you can say a lot of bad things, put a, a sinister spin on a lot of historical figures. You can say the founding fathers were slave owners and that sort of thing. But there really isn't anything bad that you could truthfully say about Christopher Columbus. Now, a lot of the detractors, Columbus detractors, are calling him a rapist, a murderer, a genocidal maniac, a tyrant. But he was, in fact, none of those things. Those things did happen in the West Indies. There, were, there was a great culture clash between the feudal Spaniards, who were still living under a monarchy. Let's not forget that this was the Middle Ages. And the natives. However, uh, Christopher Columbus fought against the tyranny of the Spaniards. He was actually the natives' number one advocate and the remaining voyages of Christopher Columbus, we talked before the break about his first voyage. The remaining voyages were nothing but Christopher Columbus returning to the Indies, fighting for the civil rights 
of the natives. After he made his first voyage, the crown said to him, come back to Spain, show us some of these folks and some of their artifacts. We would love to see these people. And he did. He took a, a group of, of volunteers, uh, of natives, back. Unfortunately, one of his ships had been damaged on the, on the trip over. You know, he came on the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Mm -hmm. And one of those ships was, was rendered unseaworthy. So he had to leave a contingent of his original crew in the West Indies in order to travel back on the two remaining ships with the enhanced crew that contained these native passengers. And some of the natives on the ship died because they did not have the antibodies and they were not prepared for the trip. And listen, transatlantic voyages were difficult in those days. They were yes. fatal for even Europe. I, I like when you said there, Rob, let's not forget these were the Middle Ages. Yeah. I think a lot of people looking back on this time and a lot of people judging Columbus now That's right. have forgotten they have that forgotten. this all happened in the Middle Ages. Yes. And if you've studied anything about history, folks, you know that the Middle Ages were quite different from right now. Go ahead, Rob. That's right. Yeah, some scholars say the Middle Ages ended in the 1200s, some say the 1500s, but either way, it's very close in time to, to the medieval period. Right. So he returns to Spain, uh, and, he, and he shows off the, the artifacts, and he introduces the natives to, uh, to, to the, the, the crown and the civilians of Cadiz, and he is hailed as a hero. But meanwhile, back in the West Indies, the Spaniards that had been left behind right. had some culture conflicts with the natives. And there was physical and mortal conflict on both sides. Colum but Columbus was a, bene a benevolent man. He was a devout Christian. He was a very religious, devout Christian. And he loved these people. He loved he them. He truly loved them. He, as a matter of fact, became such good friends with uh, one of the Taino chieftains, a man named Guaycanagari, that when Guaycanagari was mortally wounded by a rival Taino tribe and killed, Columbus adopted Guaycanagari's son, Guaycan, and raised him as his own son. One of these native people, young boy. Yes, let adopted. me say that again. Christopher Columbus had a full-blooded Taino son that he loved and raised. He was not a racist. He didn't have anything against the natives. He fought for them. When he returned on the second voyage to find that all of the Spanish settlers had been murdered by the, the, the natives there, uh, he went on an investigative scouring of the West Indies to find out what happened. And because he had so many friends among other Taino tribes, he got a clearer picture. So when he was trying to develop the Spanish settlements in the second voyage, the second sojourn there, he became peacemaker. Now, unfortunately, the nobles that were being brought over were given somewhat of a deal that was detrimental to the West Indies. The crown wanted settlers, and they didn't have enough nobles, landowners, who wanted to leave the comfort of Cadiz for the tropical frontier of the West Indies. Right. So Spain made a deal with convicted prisoners, rapists, murderers, horrible people, and said to these people, we will exonerate you for your crimes if you accept a noble title and land in the West Indies. Well, but it wasn't Columbus who was behind that. No, that was King Ferdinand and, and Queen Isabella that came up with that plan. So they exonerated horrible, horrible people, gave them noble titles, sent them over to swell the ranks of the, of the old nobles that were over there so that they could establish settlements so there. So Columbus, after all this happened, wound up getting blamed for all of the misdeeds of the imperialists. The misdeeds that he fought actively against. He actively fought against them. Yes, he was made governor of the West Indies because of his discovery. And he found himself a low-born, genuine, turned governor. Yes, yeah, so let's remember, folks, he was not a Spaniard. He was Italian. That's right. He found himself having authority over these high-born or nouveau riche Spanish nobles. So not only was he not a noble himself, he, they considered him a foreigner. They had nothing but contempt for him when he said to them, you folks have to build the settlements. They weren't used to building anything. They were nobles. They had servants to do all of that, but the servants and couldn't build And they wanted to enslave the native people. So they said to Columbus, our servants are dying we don't have, enough, don't have enough hands to build the settlements. Let's make the natives build the settlements for us. And Columbus said, no. 
He would not have it. And this was a constant source of friction between the nobles and Columbus. And so they conspired together to oust him from office and sent him back to Spain to answer these charges. His third voyage was coming back after having answered the charges. But in the time that he had been in Spain answering the charges, the Spain, ha Spain had sent another nobleman, a man by the name of Francisco de Bobadilla. Uh, and Bobadilla was a reconquistador. This was a, a war hero who had driven, by the Spanish perspective, who had driven many of the jihadists out of Spain. This man came back from the Reconquista with blood on his hands. And Spain said, you're just the man to sort of keep the peace in the West Indies. We've got all these conflicts with the natives. The nobles hate Columbus. Columbus is struggling to, to reign in the nobles. So they sent Bobadilla over there. And Bobadilla only joined the conspiracy. He wrote horrible things about Columbus, lies. The first thing he did when he got over there was he confiscated Columbus's home, he put Columbus in chains, he confiscated all of his effects, he destroyed or kept all of the records that Columbus had kept that would have proven Bobadilla's right. lies, and he made additional claims against, Bo against Columbus and had him sent back to Spain again, this time in chains. This is terrible, but when he was sent back to Spain, mm -hmm. he was eventually exonerated. Columbus was exonerated. Yes. Now, I just want to uh, try to uh, summarize this, folks, and tell you that Rob has gained all this information from four different primary sources. He went back and did all the research, and Rob, it was a man named Howard Zinn who wrote some kind of newfangled history that created all this misinformation that is poisoning the legacy of Columbus and that got into our schools. Yes, that's right. So I'll talk a little bit about Zinn. So you mentioned that there were four voyages of Columbus. There actually was a fourth voyage, but that fourth voyage was very short-lived. After he had exonerated himself and proven Bobadilla's calumny to be false in front of the crown, he returned one last time to oust Bobadilla from office. But as it turned out, his testimony before the crown was enough to have the crown have Bobadilla removed, mm -hmm. and they sent someone else, a man named Ovando, who took over in the West Indies. But Ovando was just as bad, if not worse, than Bobadilla. And when Columbus went back the fourth time to the West Indies, mm -hmm. it was an attempt to oust Ovando and protect the rights of the Native Americans. Uh, oh, they would give him no traction. They pretended they couldn't even understand him because of his genuine accent. I mean, he, he gained no ground. And he returned to Spain, not having accomplished much on that fourth voyage. But what he did when he returned to Spain was he petitioned the crown successfully for civil rights legislation. Now, it took some decades for that civil rights legislation, which was immediately enacted, to actually be enforced. Columbus's successor, uh, a Dominican friar by the name of Bartolomé de las Casas, was successful in getting the legis legislation enforced. But Columbus got the legislation passed. Now, what Howard Zinn did in the 1970s was he took all of these calumnious writings of Bobadilla, all of these lies that had been proven false 500 years before and discarded into the, into the trash bin of history. He dug them out and presented them as if that it was new information and things that we hadn't known of before. And of course they were all lies, they had been proven to be lies, but the academic institutions ate it up. This is what they wanted to hear, and this is how all the misinformation of Columbus came to be. And we, maybe we will have Rob one again. This is a fascinating story. Rob, I am so grateful for all the research that you have done. It's been a labor of love, folks. And uh, remember, you can always find us here at rvntv.tv. You can find me, Dan Zerucci, at danzerucci.com. I want to end, as I always do, Rob, with a quote. And this is from a man who knew a little bit about civil rights, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and here's what he said. We are not makers of history. We are made by history. This is Dan Cerucci. I hope you enjoyed this quick history lesson. Come back and see us again on The Advocates.